Hello, everyone. Today, we explore the city of Sydney's plans for lower income households in high density neighborhoods. You'll be hearing today from Azel Easthope from the City Future Research Center at the University of New South Wales about two neighborhoods with the same local government area in Sydney, both with considerable populations of lower income households living in apartments, but which provide markedly different day to day experiences for their residents. I'm Rodrigo Silva, and today let's talk about urban planning. Welcome to our episode, Hazel. Thanks, Rodrigo. Good to be here. So the first question for you would be, why is this topic so important? Well, a lot of research that's been done on condominiums so far focuses on luxury high rises, um, talks about things like um, uh, their use as safety deposit boxes in the sky, how they're marketed to well off residents. But in Australia, lots of people on lower incomes live in condominiums. And we wanted to talk about that and what it means for planners and what it means for housing development um, in our cities. So um, I guess I should start by saying, what do I mean when I say lots of people live in condominiums? When I'm, when I'm talking about condominiums, I'm talking about private apartment buildings where each individual unit is owned separately. In Australia, we call them strata title. They're called lots of different things in lots of other countries, but condominiums is the um, internationally recognized. Um, um, so we could talk if, if you want about some of the historical reasons for that, but uh, um, okay, <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting a nod. So um, part of the reason for that is that we have quite a small supply of public housing. And also we have much fewer rental buildings than in many other countries. So buildings that are built um, for the purpose of, of renting out. So essentially, if you rent in a private apartment in Australia, you're most likely renting in a condominium, um, which we call strata title here. So the result is that um, large proportions of lower income apartment residents live in, in these condominium um, housing. The other thing that's really interesting, I think, about the Australian case is that um, lower income condominium residents often live side by side with higher income residents. So it's not the case that we have neighborhoods of lower income condos and neighborhoods of higher income condos, but we, we have a mix of um, resident profiles within the same neighborhoods. And I think that's really interesting when we're thinking about planning and private planning for private development, fully private condominium dominated precincts to think about the, the mix of people who are likely to live in them. So that's that's really what the paper explores. Um, how is this done? And we do that through two case studies, which are in the same local government area, as you said, one of which we might call um, a, a best case or ideal scenario, and the other one is a mm -hmm. much less than ideal scenario. Mm -hmm. So these are both neighbourhoods in the same local government area with the same um, uh, local government responsible for their planning um, and the same state government responsibilities for planning, mm -hmm. but with markedly different outcomes for residents. And, and in the paper, we explore what's happened um, mm -hmm. through a detailed, in-depth dive into those mm -hmm. two cases. And uh, before we jump into the findings, what when you started this research, so what were you hoping to find? What was your research gap? So the... The paper is actually based on a, a slightly larger research project, um, which uh, focused on how to plan high density apartment neighbourhoods that would meet the needs of lower income residents. Um, and that project also looked at um, public housing provisions, private um, housing provision of apartments. And we thought that that's really important because although lots of lower income households do live in these developments, and in the case of private developments, um, lots of lower income households live in private apartment developments, their needs are seldom explicitly considered or catered for. So their needs as apartment residents, but also their needs as residents. Um, so in this paper, we focused on the private story. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Of course. And we wrote the paper because the contrast between these two neighborhoods was so extreme. Um, despite the fact that they're both made up almost entirely of private condominiums. And they're in the same place. 
of course i think this uh i think this contextualization of how the situation so how it works in australia uh contrasting to other countries and now jumping into this uh, research gap is uh, was a uh, very very interesting so can you tell us what are the main findings of your article then sure so i'll um I'll briefly describe the two the two case study areas. Mm -hmm. um, the first one uh, we we have called Upper Strathfield. Um, so it's the the less than ideal um, case study. So to give you a kind of picture, of people who live in Upper Strathfield um, in Sydney, who we spoke to, um, they were living next to empty development sites. So sites where the, the previous houses had been demolished or um, had not yet been demolished, but no new development had occurred many years um, without the street upgrades or the park that they'd been told were coming when they moved to the area. Um, the development in the surrounding area was delayed. That also delayed the contributions that the developer would have provided um, to fund local public infrastructure. And for example, one grandmother we sp spoke with, she walks past these empty um, sites with her grandchildren to catch a train to go to a park in another suburb. Um, so not, not an ideal um, outcome there. So residents who live there, they did talk about how convenient the location is. It is next to a major um, transport hub, train station and a major shopping center. But the closest parks and children's playgrounds are more than a kilometer away. There's no community center. And um, residents told us there was nowhere to meet and talk or hang around. Um, there's heavy traffic which made walking in the area unpleasant. And the site is actually sandwiched between uh, the heavy rail line and a major highway. So then if we turn to the other case study area, um, Roads West, uh, it's um, it, in a different area within the local government area. Um, it's waterfront, it sits on a river. Mm -hmm. uh, it also is walking distance from a train line. Um, it has fantastic local parks. It has a multi-purpose community center. It was designed with community input and funded and negotiated developer contribution to that community. Um, residents told us that their neighborhood gave them a really high level of everyday amenities. It was quiet, attractive, and an enjoyable place to live. Um, and they especially liked the, the waterfront walks, um, community center, and access to the shops and the trains. So those neighbourhoods are providing a really different quality of life. In the paper, we talk about why that happened um, and what we can learn um, about, about those, those two cases. The other thing I should say is that um, these developments were also occurring or, or in the case of Upper Strathfield, not occurring around the same time as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So there, there's a difference in the time uh, of the research. Uh, well, no, I mean, what I'm saying is it's not, it's not that um, they're occurring at completely different times. Mm -hmm. um, the, the development um, period is quite long, but mm, contingent. Okay. Of, of course. And so it's interesting to do different uh, contracts. So my question would be for you now. So now what? Can you indicate uh, what comes next in this topic? So what's now left to find? Um, well, I think... What I think what I need to explain to answer that question is how did how did we get here? You know, how do we have Upper Strathfield, which has a not, a not very desirable outcome, and Roads West, which has a very desirable outcome? So um, Upper Strathfield was at the edge of a lot of strategic planning proposals, but it wasn't central to any of them. Um, so, for example, there were proposals to upgrade the major highway that I mentioned. There were proposals to put in a new metro station nearby. Um, a series of kind of rolling proposals that might have impacted on what could be developed in the site, um, but where the site was not central to, or strategically central to any of those proposals. And um, what people um, have indicated to us is that, that they think that one of the major landowners in the area was sitting on the sites and not developing them um, mm. with a view to perhaps them being able to develop them at higher densities if some of these were to come off. Um, so sit, sitting on the sites and, and over uh, 
getting a more profitable outcome. So in contrast, um, Rhodes West was a, a high profile site. Um, it involved uh, larger development companies, what we call tier one development companies. So kind of the, the big boys in town. Um, it had a lot more local and state level political attention. And that brought with it a lot more resourcing and coordinating of planning approaches. And it became central. It became central to the strategic planning story. Um, and it was resourced um, appropriately. In the paper, we discuss how that was able to happen. And, and there are many reasons for that. Um, one is, is simply the geography. Um, Upper Strathfield is sandwiched between a heavy rail line and um, a major road, while Roads West is on the riverfront. Um, but there are also other reasons. Um, Upper Strathfield was on the edge of various um, strategic proposals, including a new metro and an upgrade to the highway. Um, while Roads West was, was central and a focus um, as a, a precinct for upgrade um, that received both local and state level political attention and associated with that more resourcing um, and uh, coordinated planning approaches. So the question that we ask in the paper or this, um, the problem that we pose is how can this be allowed to happen um, if we can demonstrate through Roads West that we can achieve excellent planning outcomes for lower income residents in um, private apartment developments, why aren't we achieving them in all developments? Um, and that's why the two cases in the same local government area are so interesting. Um, or put another way, how can we try and achieve types mm -hmm. of outcomes that we achieve in Roads West in places like Upper Strathfield? And so we explore in the paper um, two main areas. One is um, planning and public infrastructure provision, and, and the other is place management and community engagement. And we compare what, what happened and didn't happen uh, in the two case study areas um, in that um, sense. Uh, one of the important differences in terms of place management and community engagement was the delivery of the community centre in Rhodes West. Um, Upper Strathfield doesn't, doesn't have one. Uh, and also a dedicated place manager position within the local council in Rhodes West, which also wasn't afforded to Upper Strathfield, um, that was very important in the Rhodes case for achieving the positive outcomes. Mm -hmm that uh, were achieved. So why can't we achieve um, this in, in all neighbourhoods, not just in high profile sites? Of course. So you yeah. asked before, what, what does this mean for further research? Exactly. Um, I think we've, we've demonstrated how um, by just looking at two cases in depth, we can really start to explore the, the politics of the planning process um, and also some of the, the good practices that we might want to replicate. Um, and I would be calling for many other researchers to be doing many other case studies like this at that neighbourhood or precinct scale um, with a critical reflection on the planning process so that we can learn more about um, what we should be seeking to achieve across the board and also raising these political questions um, and not just assuming that uh, private condominium developments are going to house wealthy, wealthy people um, and provide a good quality of life for, um, for them. So if there was one takeaway that I wanted um, people listening to this talk uh, mm -hmm. to, to go away with, um, I would say so long as we're primarily relying on the private market to deliver housing, lower income residents are going to live in private condominiums and governments are going to need to intervene through appropriate planning processes to ensure that their needs are met. Or put another way, don't forget that lower income people will live in condominiums too. Of course, so, an, important, an important punchline and still a lot of research to be done in the topic. Um, absolutely. Ezel, can you provide us to the listeners some additional resources about the topic that you discussed today? Some, some other, and some self-promotion is, allow, is allowed uh, if it's the case. So can you recommend more materials for our listeners to explore this topic? I would love to, Rodrigo. Um, so there's, uh, there's a the, the report, the broader report on which this paper is based um, was published by the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute. Um, and I can provide a link that perhaps you can link to this uh, presentation to that report. Um, it has much more detail and also um, additional case studies uh, in the city of Melbourne. Uh, and I've 
I'll also provide links to two news articles uh, that we published in the conversation um, mm -hmm. based on this project as well for, for further um, okay. background and, and reading. Perfect. And uh, thank you, Hazel, for your participation here today. Um, it was my pleasure. This episode is available on Let's Talk About Urban Planning website, on Koji.us YouTube channel, as well as in podcast directories. Hazel, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Rodrigo.